Hello, welcome to Human Tech, a podcast about the intersection of humans and technology. My name is Guthrie. I'm here with Susan. Hello, Susan. Hi, Guthrie. And today our topic is vision. Um, we have a, uh, you want to talk about our course that we sell? Yeah, we have a course um, called Vision and Perception, which is... Really? Yeah. I thought it was Vision in the Brain. No, that's a, we give a, a keynote talk called Vision in the Brain. Oh, but this is different. Well, it's very similar, but I, it's not just vision. So the course, we do a little bit on other senses as well in the course. Anyway, it's part of our um, brain and behavioral science curriculum. Yeah, so... And we also have stuff on vision, information on vision in our uh, user experience curriculum too. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, vision. Um, I don't know. I th- I just think how we see and what we see and what we don't see and how that works in the brain. I I find it all interesting. Maybe I'm just strange and weird. But I think if you are someone who um, designs anything that has a visual component, right, like a screen or a page or a mm, video or a marketing message or anything else, I think it really helps to know a little bit about how vision works and specifically what you just said, actually, which was vision and the brain, because you know, what we know is that it's not just what the eye is seeing or the eyes are seeing, but um, a a lot of what we think we are seeing is actually what the brain is doing. So anyway, yeah, that's what I thought we'd talk about today. Does that sound good? That works for me. Yeah, sure. From two people who uh, have really poor vision and have to wear glasses. (laughs) We actually know our vision is just fine. As long as we have our glasses. There are people who have truly bad vision. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And have visual uh, diseases and things like that. So And like, or we don't have to wear like super thick glasses. Like no. Your glasses are pretty crazy. Well, I have those, you know, oh, let's not go into it. Okay, let's talk about vision. So let's see, Guthrie, I think it might be time for some quizzes. Quiz away. Quiz away. Uh, okay, so do you know what part of the brain uh, processes visual information? Visual cortex. Well, see that? I gave you an easy one just to get you warmed up. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, what do you know about certain types of vision and how, and how that's processed in the brain? Anything? you got to be more specific. Okay. So... If you are looking at uh, a line on a page, is that processed in the same place as if you are looking at, um, mm, let's say, uh, shapes on a page or color on a page? No. You are right. You are right. So. When we talk about vision, um, there's some real, I think there's some really interesting things about vision. So first let's talk about V1, V2, V3, and V4. So these are very particular areas in your visual cortex that are kind of primed to uh, pay attention to certain types of visual stimuli, like uh, one of those handles color, another one handles shape, another one handles size, and another one handles um, whether uh, an object or a line is straight up and down or whether it's tilted. So apparently, from an evolutionary perspective, it was really important for us to be able to distinguish those factors fast. And these, this part of the visual cortex is sometimes called pre-attention, the idea being that you respond to it before you're even conscious that you're seeing anything and what that means is that we're really um, sensitive it really gets our attention if something is a different color than everything else around it if um, something is instead of either vertical or horizontal it's at an angle that'll really capture our attention if um, 
if something is larger than everything around us, uh, and if something is moving in, especially um, not just moving in from the periphery, and we're going to talk about peripheral vision later in a minute, but if it's moving, um, we're particularly sensitive to something zooming in really fast. Uh, that will definitely grab our attention, which actually makes sense, right? Because from an evolutionary perspective, if something is suddenly getting re- big really fast, do you know what that means? That means it's coming towards you. Really fast. <laughs> yeah. So whether that's like a, a bear, like a bear or a tiger or a big rock or yeah, whatever it is, that's something you want to notice. So we have these uh, this area of our cortex, which is really sensitive to all those things. But interestingly, and I have a question too. What? You know, so you why do we? Thought, yeah, you finish your thought. Finish well, your thought. my thought was that what I was going to say is these four separate areas. Um, if you have all of those things all together, then it doesn't grab attention. So if you have something that's tilted and it's a different color and it's a different size and it's zooming in, that actually gets our attention less than if just one of those factors changed. And that's because these are separate parts of the visual cortex. So it, you know, we have a tendency, I think, when we want to grab someone's attention to do a lot of things visually, and that actually is the opposite of what we should be doing. All right, what was your question? So why do we have different parts of the brain? You mean in general, or why do, are there different yeah, parts sure. of the visual cortex? And, yeah, in general, but specifically with vision. Oh, boy, I don't know if I can answer that, really. I mean, uh, I, I I guess I would say, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, just the whole idea of specialization is an interesting question. I mean, not just of the brain, but, you know, of, of, of any parts of our body. I mean, why do we have hands and those are different than feet and those, right? So, uh, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, the theory is that that having the specialization provided us with some kind of benefit that helped us stay alive and survive and pass on our genes. Um, I mean, it it you know what one of the things that that we're finding out is that um, although we do have the, these parts of the brain you know, like the visual cortex and then within the visual cortex, you know, subparts, and then we have the auditory cortex and it's, and so on. What we're discovering in the last 10 years or so is that, 10, 15 years, is that these um, are very uh, flexible. So the term that's used is neuroplasticity. So we used to think that these were really you know, firm brain structures and language was only processed over here and vision was only processed over here. And now we know that actually the brain is quite malleable. There's a tendency for the brain to, you know, process certain kinds of information in one area, but that's not a hard and fast rule. And if anything is wrong with that one area, uh, the brain can often, not always, but can often figure out uh, you know, use another part of the brain to do that task instead. And also the brain is really good at, um, you know, when, when we develop things that are brand new, for instance, you know, we've talked about on another episode, we talked about reading and about that reading is relatively new to humans. And so, you know, we haven't really evolved a part of our brain for reading. So it just uses, you know, other parts of the brain to do reading. Um, So, you know, there's this combination of certain specificity, but also certain plasticity, which allows me to say a lot of fancy words all in one sentence. I liked it. Did that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, so we have V1, V2, V3, V4, and those are pre, called pre-attention. And then we have, you know, all the rest of the visual cortex where everything else is processed, like color and uh, complex shapes and complex images. Um, 
We have pattern recognition areas. Uh, one of the things that um, we've come to realize is that when we recognize, you know, like if I'm looking at a, an object in the room, like a lamp or something, or a cup on my desk, you know, how, how does my brain know that it's a cup or how do, how do I know that that's a lamp? And the latest theory uh, on that is that we use something that, that's been labeled geons so that there are these basic shapes like, um, and these are three-dimensional shapes like uh, cones or spheres or boxes. And we, there's a number of these that uh, we, our brain can process pretty fast. And then when we're looking at an object, it's, to us it's a combination of those geons. So, and it, and it seems to be particularly important, um, like if you were drawing an icon or drawing something and you wanted people to be able to recognize it, uh, the idea is that you want to pay attention to where the geons intersect. That that's what where our uh, our vision and our brain focuses on. Um, so if you take, for example, uh, a, a coffee mug, right? And you and I'm looking at a coffee mug on my desk right now. And you know, there's the shape of the mug, and in my case, it's kind of spherical. And then there's the shape of the handle. We decide, of course, it's all happening very fast and pretty much unconsciously, but we decide that what we're looking at is a coffee mug, particularly by looking at the places where the different shapes or geons intersect with each other. So, yeah, so uh, uh, how, how specific is a geon? What do you mean? Well, like, uh, do, do, do we differentiate between squares and rectangles? Um, yes, we do. I'm trying to remember how many geons there are altogether. I think there's like 13 or 15 yeah. that, that have supposedly been identified. So it's not a, you know, there's not like a hundred of them, but there's not two. Hmm. So yeah, it's just pretty much, your, you know, basic shapes. If you th- triangle, <laughs> sphere, square, <laughs> rectangle, why are you laughing? Just, just you, uh, you just sitting there listing all the shapes. Can, can you think of more shapes? <laughs> there are more shapes. Trapezoid, but, hexazoid. Yeah. Okay, let's not go there. Anyway, so let's see. That's how we recognize things. Um, let's talk about one of my favorite topics: uh, peripheral vision versus central vision. So. You know what, uh, do you know what these are? Yes, I do. And I think we may have mentioned them in prior podcast episodes, but go ahead. So, um, you know, when you look straight ahead, that's your central vision. Uh, and then while you're, while you're looking straight ahead, if, you know, what you can see, like way off to the side is your peripheral vision. And, um, it's only been in the last, I don't know, not even 10 years, maybe like hmm, seven years, that we're really starting to get an understanding of peripheral vision and how important it is. So, I mean, we obviously knew we had it, but now we're beginning to realize all the things that happen in peripheral vision that don't happen in central vision. So here's what we know about peripheral vision. We use peripheral vision to... Um, the, the research researchers that first came up with this who are called Larson and Lashke, they, uh, they came up with the, this phrase, the gist of the scene. So we use our peripheral vision to kind of get this really big holistic view of what, where are we, what are we looking at, um, and uh, you know, are we where we think we are, are we in the right place, that kind of thing. And uh, what's interesting about our peripheral vision is it's not detailed at all. You know, we, like if you, with your central vision, you can see really clearly. Um, and if you can't, you know, you have glasses that helps you do that. But in peripheral vision for everybody, whether you need glasses or not, is very, really blurry. It's kind of odd. Um, 
And so you really don't see very well in your peripheral vision, but your peripheral vision is so important. It determines um, what you should look at next. So you actually process the information in your peripheral vision really quickly. It's especially sensitive to uh, images of danger or emotion. Um, And then based on what, you know, the peripheral vision is seeing, it, it makes you uh, move your, your eye gaze, your central vision to a certain spot. It may even make you turn your head so that you can get a good look at something with your central vision. I mean, it really, I, I, I usually, the phrase I use is peripheral vision calls the shots. Um, and I don't think we realized how important peripheral vision was until recently. It's really sensitive to movement, you know, any movement in your peripheral vision will grab attention. That's why, you know, if you're looking at something on the computer screen and there's an animated image, you know, repeating over and over, that'll it's really hard to avoid looking at it. Um, that's because your peripheral vision picks it up. So uh, I think peripheral vision is just amazing. And I don't think we, you know, if you're talking about design or if you're talking about design of like a big desktop uh, software or something, I don't think we, a lot of times we don't make enough use of it. We have like white space, you know, in our peripheral vision. And uh, that's kind of wasted, really. So yeah, peripheral vision, central vision um, is, that's that's an interesting distinction. Uh, let's see what else you don't want, I you think want to, I, th- no, I think yeah. it's really cool that um, basically the whole thing with peripheral vision is just another example of things that happen not in our consciousness yeah that is really really powerful but we as humans under represent and undervalue just because it's unseen yeah because it's not conscious we don't realize how important it is definitely definitely but the conscious part that's really i mean that's just kind of the icing on the top really it's just a little piece right of what's really going on of all the processing going on yeah and um you know what what we see even with our central vision is you know what your eye is seeing and the image that your retina is recording and sending through your optic nerve to your brain I mean that's not even what you think you're seeing I mean when you describe like I'm looking out my window right now and I could describe to you what I see and a lot of that description is actually a lot of that interpretation is actually happening in my brain it's not happening with my eyes yeah I mean for one thing everything you see when it hits your brain it's upside down so I mean, even right right then is odd, right? Uh, I don't know why it hits your your brain upside down, but it does, and then your brain knows it's upside down and kind of turns it around. Um, for years, there was this there was a an urban legend or a myth that you know you could put on glasses that invert the image, and that then your brain would. So, so that it would hit your brain right side up instead of upside down. And then your brain would uh, compensate and turn it around again. That's actually not true. Yeah. Um, but what interestingly, if you wear these glasses, I actually have a pair of these. I bought them online for like $15. It's just a prism and it inverts the image. Um, but if you do wear glasses like that, uh, in, I don't know, like a day or two, um, you still, everything looks upside down, but you are able to navigate through the world upside down. Did you know that? Yeah, I did. I did very cool. So, uh, the research that's been done on this, I actually talked to, um, the research that was done on this was done originally like in the 1940s and 50s in Germany, but there's a, there's a guy uh, who has who replicated it in like the 1980s, 1990s, 
And um, so I, I actually had the opportunity to talk to him not too long ago. Uh, and he said that what happens is people are able to, the, if you ask them, what's it like, right? You know, do you see things right side up or upside down? And they'll say, oh, everything's still upside down. But somehow it becomes just an alternate way to view the world like it doesn't seem weird after a while and people can they can write like that they can ride a bicycle they can walk I mean not right away at first it's really disorienting and they fall down a lot but after a while like a a couple days if they wear it long enough they're able to oh uh, go ahead I'm gonna have a question they're able to navigate through their world in an upside down way go ahead what's your question okay so could you here's another interesting thought that maybe would would do something okay yeah what if you were wearing uh, noise proof headphones noise proof headphones yeah okay. noise canceling headphones yeah and what it did was things that would normally be and you had a mic outside of each ear right on the headphone itself there's a little microphone mm-hmm. but it played what was coming into the left ear into the right ear and played was coming into the right ear into the left ear. Okay. Right? So, like, if someone was talking on one side of you, it, it, would, it would be like they were talking on the other side of you. Yeah. Would your brain eventually switch ears and then you'd hear normally again? Well, that's cool, right? I don't know, actually. I mean, you know, you, I, I kind of did my PhD research on this, but um, I don't know the answer. See, you should have been a graduate student in psychology. This is exactly I the kind of thing you should have. Could have done some research. Isn't that, on. isn't that cool though? That would be very interesting. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. All right, here's an aside. Do you want a total aside that has nothing to do with vision, or should I not? Sure. So dogs, and this is true for humans too, uh, if you talk into the dog's left ear, it, pro- it, will pro- it processes mainly... I hope I get this right. Uh, emotional tone and information. And if you talk into its right ear, it processes the actual um, syllables and sounds. Now I know that dogs don't understand language, but dogs do understand. You know, they they can learn a, com- a command like sit, right, and stay. And so, in in a way, they know those words, right? Uh, and they know what they're supposed to do. But but um, th- they will be able to respond better to the actual word or respond better to your your tone, your emotional content, like you're upset or you're happy or you're scared um, in one ear over the other. And that and that's because this has to do with what you're talking about in the fact yeah. that certain information is processed in certain parts of the brain, and uh, one ear um, is uh, more attuned to, to one type of information than the other. And the same is true for humans. Okay, that's a little aside. We will go. <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with vision, but that does have to do with perception. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's see. Back to vision. Interesting things about our vision. Well, you know. We have talked before on another episode. Uh, I'm pretty sure we talked about like the um, the brain port, uh, which takes information. Um, f- that's where you, you you have the camera in the glasses, and it's the camera sends visual information, but through the glasses, not through your retina. Uh, uh, into a little piece of plastic that you have on your tongue and it translates what you're seeing into pulses on the tongue. This is for people who um, are visually impaired. That, by the way, is a Wisconsin company. 
Ta-da. Wow. And I'm from fast. Wisconsin. So they do that in Madison, Wisconsin. And what they've used it for is if you don't have any vision, if you're blind, um, it can help you, quote, see. So you're not really seeing in the same sense that, you know, uh, someone with sight sees, but you are able to start to process what how ha- it's fascinating, you know, and this is that neuroplasticity. And it's been, uh, there's all all different kinds of ways besides vision and the tongue there's things with your skin um, that uh, what happens is your brain is really ready to process information and to find patterns and it almost doesn't matter what what sense you know vision hearing skin tongue where it's coming from, the brain is able to, when it gets information, in this case, when it gets visual information on its on your tongue, uh, it's able, after about 15, 20 minutes, to, to realize that the information coming in is describing visual phenomena. Yeah. Which I find, I think that's just miraculous. That it the can brain that. can just, it'll take, just take any input and turn it into an output. Turns it into data. Yeah. And then, and, what, and what's interesting is also that um, the research is showing that it, um, it realizes after a while that the information is visual and it starts processing it in the visual cortex, even for people who are blind and normally don't have very much or any activity going on anymore in the visual cortex because they can't see. Uh, When they use the brain port and have this data on their tongue, it starts to stimulate the visual cortex. The brain recognizes, oh, this is visual information. I'm going to send it to the part of the brain that processes that best. So that's, I, you know, that's just amazing. Our brains are just uh, so amazing, so smart, right? Because, yeah. again, that's all happening without, you know, it's not like you have to monitor it, the information coming in and say, oh, I think this might be visual. Let's try processing it in the visual cortex. I mean, you know, this is not conscious at all, right? Your brain just does it. Uh, and there's been, you know, using the, these devices like the brain port, people are able to, you know, quote, like I always put in quotes, see, but they, they're able to distinguish visual objects. They're able to move through the world. Um, they're able to, you know, pick up an object on the table because they can see it. Um, there's a one pretty well-known guy who's worked with the brain port who uh, he used to be a uh, mountain climber so he he climbs you know he goes climbing now uh, using his brain port to see so uh, pretty uh, pretty interesting stuff I think that yeah the, I, I think the, the uh, I mean obviously the, the, the future of uh, eyes are especially good place to focus was that a pun uh, no, no, it really, it, it really wasn't. I mean, it maybe should have been. What do you uh, mean? Eyes are a good place to focus. So, like, uh, so, so, because eyes are uh, because the just because of the inputs and where things can go wrong. Mm-hmm. Ears were the first place, and now they're doing all kinds of cool stuff with ears. Mm-hmm. And eyes are kind of the next, uh, the next place where you can see some really cool advance advancements in kind of uh, uh, basically how if we can create machines or something and then just have it connect to the brain somehow, and then the brain can use it to see somehow. Mm-hmm. How long do you think uh, before we just have a camera that is then hooked up to your retina? Well, why would we have that? Tell me what, you know, why wouldn't we just use our eyes? If you're blind. Oh. 
if you have like if you have a problem with your retina and you just have something it would be it would be a camera that would then be hooked directly to your optic nerve well i think that does exist you know people are blind for various reasons okay? uh, yeah i know well that's why that's why the eyes are such a good place right because there's problems with the retina problems with the eye socket right problems with right the sometimes optical nerve, problems sometimes with the... the problem is that you know your retina isn't working and so there's no visual information coming in right um and that's what in cases like that where the problem is literally with the eye that's why that something like the brain port right that is has a camera and that data is coming in through the tongue and so you're just bypassing the eye entirely right um so it really depends on what the, what the vision problem is some people their 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 retinas are okay the problem is in the brain Right or the problems with the optic nerve or the so you know which device is going to work for you really depends on what the issue is. But there there are um, you know there's a lot of work being done with all of this in terms of you know if you're if you can't see because there's a problem with the retina, then here's the camera. If you can't see because there's a problem with the brain, you know then then here's how we train a different part of the brain to process the visual information. So, yeah, I think uh, there's an amazing amount of, uh, of work going on in terms of having people be able to see. I mean, maybe in another episode we can do hearing because that is, you know, kind of equally as amazing. And there's, there's all kinds of devices that uh, are being used in a similar way as the brain port to... Uh, actually allow people to hear by translating well there's all kinds of devices that allow people to hear again depending on what the problem is one of them um, allows people to get the information on their skin and then uh, the brain just like with the brain port with the visual data on the tongue, in this case, there's auditory data uh, on your skin, and people can actually start to hear the words that are being spoken based on the pattern on their skin. So you know, it's it's. Uh, I think there's we're going to keep making a lot of advances, and that's partly because we're understanding the brain better partly because we're understanding the particular, you know, part of the body, like the eye or the ear better, and then partly because we're developing these cool technologies. What's your, uh, what's your favorite sense? <sighs> My favorite sense. Favorite in what way? You mean like personally favorite? Like if I had to give them up, this would be the last one I would give up? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, I don't know. You know, I think it's I think it's one thing to answer that question, and then I think if you talk to someone who has lost that sense, you know, that's like another thing. Um, I can't imagine losing any of my senses. I am very fortunate they are all intact. Uh, I would think losing... Um, I mean, taste and smell is tough because they're really the same thing. They're related. They're not exactly the same thing. And I, I think that would be really hard to lose. Uh, I think they'd all be hard. I think sight would be hard to lose, hearing, touch. Now, now you're just listing all the senses. I, I, can't, I just can't imagine not having one, you know? I don't know. I can't say which one I would be. You know, if for some reason I was forced to give one up, right? If I had some kind of strange disease and... And they could fix, you know, they could keep me alive and keep all of my senses, but it meant I had to sacrifice one, right? I have no idea what I would do. What would you do? Do you know? Uh, I'd probably pick vision. Yeah, I don't know. Who needs vision? Oh, come on. Oh, <laughs> don't say that. People that are listening that, that have impaired vision probably are going to say you are really wrong um but there are i mean there are a lot of aids for people that don't have good vision and i know my vision's I, already bad um 
<laughs> I mean, I know people who I've worked with people on various yeah. projects who are blind, you know, who don't see at all, and they're you know quite capable of all kinds of things. So I think yeah, it's probably, no, it's, it's really probably more aid aids for the blind than for some of the other sense losses. Well, it's, I mean, I, I bring it up because, you know, uh, when people think about, you know, how they could get through life without one of the senses, and then you go and you talk to, you know, in, with, with someone who, who maybe is blind, um, or, in, you know, and they're, and obviously it's not ideal, but like, they, they're, 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 you know, they get, they're, they're just fine. They're happy stuff often you know they don't um they, they i don't know maybe it's just me i heard an, I, I was listening to an interview um with a guy who was blind and uh you know he he says yeah he obviously misses it but um he 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 uh like 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 in his in his opinion it was like his perception of other things is um, he, 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 he just focuses more on some of the other senses that yeah. we kind of tone out, you know? Yeah. Cause the brain can only process so much, right? So like when we're watching TV, there are like other things happening and, and that, that we're just, that, that our brain is ignoring cause it's like sensory overload. Yeah. Um, but, but when you're, you know, when you're not, don't have as many things in it's not like you're less cognizant or that's not the right word, but like, it's not like you're less aware or like less acute. Like it, it just like your brain can handle like this much input. And if one of those inputs is slightly diminished, it, your, your brain then just like pays more attention to the other stuff. So mm-hmm. like when I, even, even when I take my glasses off, right? Like I can't see right, the like c- clearly right so my vision is i mean it's like i can it's you know it's blurry like i could i could i could you know i can make out a car like it's not like my vision my vision like i like i said my vision's bad but it's fine um but but uh I, you know if if I, I i would i would pay a lot more attention to like my other surroundings is is my thought mm mm-hmm. mhm but maybe I'm wrong. I could be totally wrong. I, but that's that's just a, I, I It was a very interesting interview, and I totally forgot where it was, um, where I found it. Um, but I just I thought it was, I thought it was cool. Well, and you know, if, if we talk um, about some of the technology, be, you know, we talked about the brain port, right? Um, and for people, for instance, who. Um, well, in fact, the, the, all the technology for people with sight impairment has really improved a lot lately with, with uh, for instance, you, know, you can have things read to you, right? I mean, Alexa or um, any of the other you know, machines that talk to us um, can read you something from the internet right years ago they and it's still in use there's these things called screen readers that would read html code and is translated into a very computery voice right and that didn't sound like siri or alexa it sounded like a computer voice um and interestingly uh, a lot of people that that can't see and are you know re- reading things on the internet they prefer the screen readers because they can set the speed. And I don't know if you've ever, have you ever seen uh, someone use one of those yeah. who, who is hearing impaired? They set that speed yeah, so exactly. fast. Exactly. Like, it's just like another level. We can, I, you know, if you're a, if you're not used to it, you cannot understand what's being said. I mean, first of all, it's a computer voice. And second, it's going so fast. And same, same with the with speed reading. Mm-hmm. Where I don't know if you've ever tried to see how fast you can read, and like the, the words just kind of it's like in one spot, so you don't have to move your head. Mm-hmm. And I can get up to like I'm pretty good. I'm really fast, so I get up to like two, three hundred, 
words per minute and and people uh who who i i guess that would be who are deaf who do like uh who who's um who, who's uh use sign language mm-hmm. um they, they they can go like five six hundred mm-hmm. it's just like insanely fast yeah yeah it's amazing it's- so that's just, you know, an example of that neuroplasticity that yeah. you can, you know, you have these abilities that you don't realize you have until, you know, you really train them and other abilities have fallen away. So, um, yeah, so there's all kinds of, uh, you know, aids for, and and it's my understanding, um, this may not be correct, but I, I believe I've read or heard recently that... Um, Braille readers, you know, there's a Braille is a um, a way of representing letters and words through touch, uh, and um, that those are actually being used less these days because of the advancements in um, being able to translate words into voice, right? Mm. Mm. Uh, and so back when we didn't, when we weren't very good, and do you know, by the way, who, uh, who was one of the main, uh, people who made a huge leap in the, in the technology of reading text to blind people? No. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but, uh, okay, so who's the, the famous crazy, Singularity scientist that now works at Google. Singularity scientist? Yeah. Ray you know, Kurzweil? That's right. Did you know that one of the first things he ever invented was a device for um, blind people turning turning text into sound, into, you know, a computer voice? No, I don't know a whole lot about... Um about any of that he's done a lot of uh various inventions over his lifetime that a lot of people don't aren't even aware of and that was one i don't know if it was his first big successful one or uh, but but that that was a big successful one that he did was he created the it and i believe it's called the kurtzweil something or other um reading kurtzweil reading device or something and it was a huge uh you know, it was a big, had a big impact on people with sight impairment. Mm. M- many, many years ago, I'm going to say in the 1970s or 1980s. Uh, you know, we take all of this for granted now, right? I mean, we have podcasts and we have, you know, audio books and that we can listen to over the internet, and we right there's all, and we have all these devices now that talk to us. But it wasn't that long ago when that was, technologically, that was a difficult thing to do, to figure out how to do, um, to take text and have a machine read it in a way that could be understood. But, uh, yeah, he was one of the pioneers in that field. That was kind of his first big, or one of his first big inventions. All right, so we have, so we've talked about peripheral vision versus central vision. We've talked about V1, V2, V3, V4. Um, let's see. What else can we talk about with vision? Can nothing. Talk about nothing? You want to end it there? Uh, I don't know. I we can. I want, I, we could talk about color vision, but I think that's, that's another big one. And we should probably do a whole Can I, can I drop some cool color facts? That. Yes. Go ahead. There's a certain population, I believe you ha- of women that due to, and it has to be women, um, and due to a genetic something something. <laughs> this is very exact, Guthrie. Yeah, there's a there's a mutation that happens, and they have, uh, and it, it, yeah, it's like the mutation happens on something with the chromosomes, which is why it only happens in women. I don't know, um, but. Uh, they have a extra um, cone. Mm-hmm. 
So us humans, we have three cones mm -hmm. that can sense three different types of color. Mm -hmm. And they have a fourth. That's right. Now, if you, now, other species, of course, can see totally different, right? So cats can see in ways we can't, mantis shrimps. Butterflies see more color, many more colors. Many and it's not like, oh, I see some red. Like you're seeing stuff in the infrared spectrum and the ultraviolet spectrum. And you're just, you're, it's really, you're seeing energy mm -hmm. is what they're doing. And we're, and when you see color, you're seeing energy too, but it's a very, very small sliver. Um, so I can't even imagine what that would be like. That'd be very It's cool. called a tetrachromat. Yeah. Tet I'm sorry, tetrachromat, T-E-T-R-A. Chromat. Now, you have to teach yourself to be able to distinguish the difference. I don't think it just happens. Well, here's the thing. So uh, the estimate is that um, this could be true for up to 12% of women currently on the planet. It will increase over time. Um, you are right. It's, it's only women. It has to do with a mutation on the X chromosome. And it's it's because it's related to uh, the genetics of color blindness. So, so uh, typically you will have this, the women that have this, uh, the men in the family have some form of color blindness and because that's also related to uh, mutations on chromosomes. So um, yeah, they, you know, you'd think, oh, well, you have a fourth color cone so you can see a few colors but if you think about the permutations right uh how permutations work going from three cones to four cones means you can see a lot more colors and but the the what you mentioned about being trained about it yeah um it's not that you it's not that it has to develop over time i mean if you have this chromosome you're born with it but here's the thing you are surrounded you are living in a world where most of the other people don't see those extra colors so they don't talk about them they don't point them out they would they don't put them on the uh, screen computer screen they don't put them in the painting <laughs> because they don't see it right so you you do have to get some training to become aware of it because uh, you will have been trained to to only um, talk about and and give names to um, the colors that the rest of us see. Uh, so typically, the people and you can, by the way, you can get tested if you're a woman and you think you might have this this uh, chromosome change difference, you can get a, a test for it and find out if you need, indeed have it. And so typically what happens is people who, you know, and I, it's like a correlation, so which comes first, but be, women who have been trained uh, to be an artist or in the visual arts are the ones that um, usually start to you know, really be able to work work with this extra perception. Of course, the rest of us can't hey, see what they're doing. Hey, question though. Mm -hmm. I just realized something. Mm -hmm. I was doing a little research while we were talking about uh, the test for textrochromates. Mm -hmm. And I just realized mm -hmm. you can't take a test online. No, no, you cannot. No, the test is a is a genetic chromosome test we're talking about and testing do you want to know why you can't take the test online why Guthrie? it's really cool yeah um so red green blue right mm -hmm. are the three types of led light that mm -hmm. a computer screen can produce mm -hmm. and therefore all colors that a computer screen can render are the three types of light that a human eye cone can detect. Right. And so there are no colors that a hu that a computer screen could create that a tetrachromat could identify. Well, you mean the the extra colors? Yes. 
That's correct. Yes, there, there, there are no extra colors. The entire RGB spectrum is only for us normal people. Or us uh, deficient people. So how do you find out? You get a, you get it. You uh, have you, to get a chromosome that. test. Short that's the only that. way to find out. To find out if that's, the, that's the only way. Really, that's the only way to be sure, is you have to have the chromosome test. And then, well, I mean, so so you're not going to be able to see the the extra colors on a computer screen, but you can certainly see them out in the natural world. Because. Mm because they're in the light spectrum that's being reflected off of objects. So you'll be able to see them. And you and from what I understand, uh, you can recreate them with, uh, if you're a, a, a painter or an artist, for instance, um, you know, with paint, uh, nobody else can see them except other tetrachromats. So yeah, you can you can work with it, but not on a computer screen. So cool. <laughs> now the question is, are there? I feel like there are other senses that we just don't know about. So you like mean, I I can sense when elevators go down near me. I don't even know what that means. If I'm standing by an elevator shaft, and an elevator whizzes by. Like I can feel air it. pressure or something. Perhaps, yeah, but it's not. It's not like a gust of wind. It's like I can like, like I almost get dizzy. Like I can feel the change. I would think that you're being sensitive to. I would think that would have to do with your ears or your skin or. Yeah, that makes sense, right? The so there's the negative pressure in the room yeah, that's causing my yeah. that's causing my balance to slightly I shift. Mean, yeah. So, I mean, it's certainly possible that there are other senses. It's certainly possible that our, the senses we have have other capability. Like it's only recently that we, well, actually, the tetrachromat thing, there was a guy who figured it out or suspected it and wrote about it in like 1880 in the Technically of, 1948 by Dutch scientists, but that was close. Is that who wrote about it in the back of his journal? No, I think the guy from 1948. Oh, there's something else. Found the journal or was reading through the journal from someone else. Anyway, um, you know, it's possible that that our the senses we have uh, have other capability that or that we're not aware of. It's also pos certainly possible that there's other senses. Um, so can I can I tell you how this works? By the way. Yeah. So colorblind men. Mm-hmm possess two normal cones and a mutant cone that's less, less sensitive to green or red light, which is mm -hmm. why, which is the cause of colorblindness. And so the mothers and daughters of these colorblind men have the mutant cone, but then they also have the three normal cones from their mother. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's, that's what happens. So that's so how they end up with four. Yeah. So normally when you have two people with normal color vision, you get, you, they, the, the two chromosomes come together. You have the three c normal cones from the mother and the three normal, ge the three normal, the genes for the three normal cones from the mother and the genes for the three normal cones from the father. Mm -hmm. And they come together and you get the three normal cones. Mm -hmm. But if you have the two normal and the mutant and then the three normal from the mother, you come together, uh, you get the three normal from the mother and then the mutant. From the from the colorblind, which is yeah. I think I think that's really cool. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. There you go. So anybody who has uh, colorblindness in their family, and if you're a woman, go get tested. Find out if you're a tetrachromat. I don't know what what you could do with it, but it might be interesting to know. All right, Guthrie, we are done for the moment with vision. We, we'll come back at another time and talk some more about colorblindness and color. Do you, do you like talking about vision? I do. I do. I like talking about, I like talking about things that, that are the combination of biology and the brain. That's just one of my favorite favorite things and I think you know the more we understand um, 
about how things like our perception works, then the more, the, the better we can design and the better we can come up with interesting technology solutions. And so, yeah, yeah. Something oh, that's been by the way, do you know what te- tetrachromacy means? No. All it means is tetra, meaning four. four. Mm-hmm. Um, so all it means is just having four independent channels for conveying color information. Mm-hmm. So the fourth one could be anything. So for example, goldfish are tetrachromats. They have cones for red, green, blue, and ultraviolet. Oh, so there's different, the different species have different. Yeah, it's what, what that fourth one can be all whatever things, it is. Depending on who you are or what you are. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so they have, yeah, yeah, which is which is kind of uh, interesting. Um, I wish I, I want to find out. Uh, and it's especially fascinating for people who are, for like artists, mm-hmm. to see if like they're seeing things and colors in a way that like no one else can. Like, mm-hmm. I, like, especially if you think of, like, some of the great artists, like, imagine, like, s- Starry Night or something, but, like, seeing it in, like, with, with you know. Or it also might be one of the reasons that, like, um, certain people love art so much. Like, it just looks way more amazing. <laughs> right. It's possible. Well, uh, the whole world would look way more amazing. Yeah, you'd, you'd be so much more motivated to paint and stuff. Guthrie, great talking to you. All right, I'll talk to you later. Hey, everyone, have a great week. And uh, you can email questions at info at the TNW.com. Bye. Bye.